Francisco, you may be unique in this whole world by being both a professor of biological sciences and a professor of philosophy. And this field of the philosophy of biology has been growing lately. And frankly, even though I was trained in the biological sciences and I love philosophy, I'm not as familiar with it as I am of philosophy of mind or religion or even philosophy of cosmology. So define for me the purpose of philosophy of biology and then something of the structure of the kinds of questions that it asks. Well, the process of evolution in particular has tremendous philosophical implications because if we want to understand what we are as human beings, a fundamental component has to be that we originated by a gradual process and that our ancestors of uh, a few million years ago were not human. And in fact, our own species came out only very recently, perhaps as recently as 100,000 years ago mm. in tropical Africa, and from there colonized the rest of the world. So what is a human being? In order to understand what is a human being, a philosophical question, mm. you need to understand our origin. You have to understand many other things because the process of evolution has implications with respect to what we are, not only in the general way, but explaining the details. I mean, think for example, of the um, transmission of signals that go from our senses to, to our mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that the experiences that we have when we touch something or when we see something, mm -hmm. that those things get incorporated from our senses to our nerves and go to the brains. Mm -hmm. And it's in the brains where we ex have these experiences that we call qualia, these individual sensations. But how chemical and electrical signals, mostly chemical signals, become transformed in color, shapes, and the like. It's a philosophical question. Yes. And the more fundamental question to, yet is how out of all this experience emerges the mind, the person, what mm. we mm. have as a mm. unitary view of ourselves, mm. that something that exists in us. How does that emerge? Well, that's a very fundamental philosophical right. question but we have to uh, uh, incorporate the biological knowledge and integrate it into our philosophical view mm. of how the mind works. So those are two major categories. One is, uh, what, is it, what does it mean to be human given the evolutionary certainty of how we developed? Second big question is the nature of human mind or mind in general and consciousness developing out of the biological processes. So those are two massive kinds of, of, of questions. Are there other kinds of questions that um, a, a philosophy of biology would ask? Uh, I don't know about the development of, uh, of, of, uh, of morality or yes. yeah, is, is this a, is this a Ob legitimate question? Within Obvi the obviously, you know, all the questions of uh, morality of ethics, because understanding what we are biologically and how we have common origins, and the very little diversity between different populations of the world, mm -hmm. so-called uh, races or uh, ethnic groups, uh, obviously has social implications, has ethical implications. Uh, there are all sorts of issues, philosophical issues that arise in the context of evolution. You know. The human development, going from an embryo, you know, to a full grown-up human being, uh, raises many philosophical questions as to how that process is controlled, what are the implications with respect, again, to what the person is, the relationship, the relationships of one person with another. But I will go back, since I brought it up a moment ago, to the issue of genetic variation between populations. Mm -hmm. You know, we see ourselves as being very different, say, those of us who are so-called Caucasians from, say, people from Central Africa or people from Japan and China. But if you were to take the whole variation of genetic variation or the whole human population, which has a lot, 85% of that whole variation of the world can be found in a little village. <laughs> then when you look at different towns in the same continent, you add 6% more. Uh, nice. And you add only 9% more when you look at the whole, whole world. world. Well, if we are, if so much of the variation is local, why is it that we see it as very different? It is because the adaptations that we 
in which we observe, which has to do with skin color and uh, configuration of the hair, configuration of the body, have a lot to do with the colonization of the world. You know, the, our ancestors in Africa were definitely people with very dark skin. You need that. You live in a place where there is a lot of sun because the sun causes various forms of cancer, melanomas and the like, which are among the worst kinds of cancers. As these people colonize, say, uh, the temperate zones and eventually places like Scandinavia and, and, and uh, Alaska and the like, the skin, people with lighter skin were favored by natural selection because they needed the sun. There's much less sun, much less exposure to the ultraviolet light of the sun, which we need to produce to synthesize vitamin D. Vitamin D is synthesized in the deeper layers of the skin and is done through the action of uh, ultraviolet light. A person with very dark skin living in Scandinavia yeah. and cannot do very well because cannot synthesize vitamin D. Well, mo mother, in modern times, of course, you take vitamin D, but you are talking about how humans colonize the world. Sure. So the color of the skin changes to, to use an example. So that's very conspicuous and yet involves only a very, very small <laughs> fraction of the whole genome of the yes. whole set of genes. So that, that that is a deep philosophical conclusion that comes from biology because it really shows the commonality of human beings, even though superficially we see things that look tr very different, that much all of the differences are are, 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 are much deeper in that things that we don't see. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. I think that um, these difference, differences are very superficial. Mm -hmm. They are real, but affect very little yeah. of what we are. And in the majority of the processes that are controlled by genes, all humans are identical. Yes? I'm going to give you a, a question in the philosophy of biology, which has been fascinating me. And it was really triggered uh, when we met uh, something like 10 years ago, because you made what, what to me at the time was an extraordinary claim that you believed that the uh, that human level intelligence that we're unique in, in, in the observable universe. Now that is almost diametrically opposite of what every other scientist says, just based on statistics alone. And when you said that, it was, it was a, a shocking statement. Uh, but that is a core concept of a philosophy of biology. Now you came to that not for religious reasons, but for scientific reasons. Right. And so, it's, so how do you feel about that today? We, we know now that there are many galaxies. We know the galaxies have billions of stars. Now, very recently, in the last two decades or so, we have learned also that many of these stars have planets. Right. And there are planets which are at the distance of the star and, and of the size that could be comparable to the Earth. Why are not there human beings or intelligent beings? Uh, well, we have, life has been going on, say, on Earth, for and a half billion years, we have to assume that it could have gone for comparable time in these other places. If the evolution has been going in these other places, it will have happened uh, either very long ago or would not have happened yet. It happened long ago, I mean just a few thousand years. But if something happened a few thousand years ago that is that they were intelligent beings, they will be technologically so advanced that we will know about their presence in the universe. They will visit us, or at least they will manifest themselves in some ways that we will know they are there. That has not occurred. Well, because, as I said, if we have occurred, we will know about them. Uh, think the way technology advances. I mean, science is only a few hundred years at best, and, and technology is advancing at such a tremendous rate. Imagine now evolution that happened in a place that produced intelligent beings the probability that it would have happened at the same time as ours um, is zero because yeah, you have all right. these millions of years through, right. through which the process has happened. Now, if he happened just a few thousand, not to speak of a few million years earlier, these people with this <laughs> technological issue advanced, these intelligent beings, that they will have made their presence 
known to us. So, so that's a good, that's an argument why we don't see them, but what is the underlying reason? I mean, is it, is it a biological reason that ev just the, the unlikely chance of evolution? Or? Well, there's another way of looking at it, and the improbabilities are enormous. You <clears throat> think that number of steps that have to, to take place just from going from single cell organism, I'm going to start to something like bacteria and the like, to a multicellular organism, like a, a worm or something more elaborate, like an insect, the number of steps that have to take place are so very many, and the, many, uh, the, many of, uh, the number of avenues that can be followed are so many that the probability that this would have happened again and again is, is for all practical purposes zero.